Well, good morning. It's a beautiful morning. We are blessed. God has given us rain. I am uh, very West Texas. You never stop praying for rain. You just enjoy what God is give what God gives us. Uh, this morning, uh, we're going to look at another passage from Luke, uh, Luke chapter nine, beginning in verse thirty-seven. Before we turn to God's word, let's go to Him in prayer. Would you join me? Father, we thank you. We thank you, Father, that we can come together in the blessing of of media. Father, the blessing that you've given us, we use, we utilize, and we thank you for it. Father, the, the medical personnel that are being pressed upon now, Father, we ask for blessing over them, for the nurses, the doctors, the emergency people, the first responders. God, bless them and strengthen them as they work during this time of crisis. Father, I speak a blessing. And God, I pray that you will be with us. And as we open your word, Holy Spirit, speak to us. We pray, Father, that I will decrease that you will increase. For we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Read with me, if you will, Luke chapter 9, beginning in verse 37. The next day, when they came down from the mountain, a large crowd met him. A man in the crowd called out, Teacher, I beg you to look at my son, for he is my only son. A spirit seizes him and he suddenly screams. It throws him into convulsions so that he foams at the mouth. It scarcely ever leaves him and it is destroying him. I begged your disciples to drive it out, but they could not. You unbelieving and perverse generation, Jesus replied. How long shall I stay with you and put up with you? Bring your son here. Even while the boy was coming, the demon threw him to the ground in a convulsion. But Jesus rebuked the impure spirit, healed the boy, and gave him back to his father. And they were all amazed at the greatness of God. While everyone was marveling at all that Jesus did, he said to his disciples, Listen carefully to what I am about to tell you. The Son of Man is going to be delivered into the hands of men. But they did not understand what this meant. It was hidden from them, so they did not grasp it. And they were afraid to ask him about it. An argument started among the disciples as to which of them would be the greatest. Jesus, knowing their thoughts, took a little child and had him stand beside him. And he said to them, Whoever welcomes this little child in my name welcomes me. And whoever welcomes me welcomes the one who sent me. For it is the one who is least among you all who is the greatest. Master, said John, we saw someone driving out demons in your name and we tried to stop him because he is not one of us. Do not stop him, Jesus said, for whoever is not against you is for you. As we think about this, I want you to remember that Jesus has taken Peter and James and John up on the mountain with him. And it was before them that Jesus was transfigured. They saw Moses and Elijah standing with Jesus, talking with Jesus. And we we saw last week how this had actually many important features, features of the Exodus and the one who was to come before heralding the coming of the Messiah. Raphael, the the Renaissance painter, painted a, a, a picture and he actually died while painting it. And it is a picture of all that is going on, but he takes and he links the two together. The transfiguration event with Peter and James and John up on the mountain with Jesus and Moses and Elijah. And that that's the is what the top part of the painting consists of. 
But simultaneously at the bottom is this, this great defeat of the disciples where they cannot cast out the demon. And he is the, the, the one that actually puts this together in a visual form and allows us to recognize the, 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 what was actually going on during this time at the same time the, the great revealing and yet the great failing as well. All of the gospel writers, the synoptic writers, um, put this so that we understand that it probably was happening at the same time. And, and we move f directly from the, the, the transfiguration to deal, Jesus dealing with the, the discouragement and the failure of the disciples and their faith. But as we take this, and it doesn't really at first appear that all four uh, go together, but all four of these events, the gospel writer Luke takes and he, he, he weaves them together. And his transition one from another is now, now wait, don't stop there. Here's something else. And don't stop here. Here's something else. And finally, don't stop. And so this one unit is complete as we move from faith to understanding to humility to tolerance let's let's look back at the, at the 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 first tragedy dealing with their faith as they came down a man in the in the crowd calls out teacher i beg you this this man is desperate to look at my son he's my only child. Jesus, the only Son of God, begged to look at the only Son of this man. A spirit seizes him and he, he suddenly screams and it throws him into convulsions. He foams at the mouth. It scarcely ever leaves him. It's destroying him. I begged your disciples to drive it out, but they could not. First tragedy is this boy. I, I mean, think of all the things that he has to go through. It, this this lends us to the idea that maybe it was a, a severe form of epilepsy, but I think it was much more than that. I think it was demonic. I think it was an unclean spirit, an evil spirit that was controlling and and, and, and tormenting this boy, throwing him down, the, the convulsions, the seizures, the foaming at the mouth. Think about the life he led. And if you're a parent, you know this so well. Whenever your child hurts, you hurt worse. This man was hurting. He was so desperate. Desperate to, for anything for his child. And he knew that 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 Jesus, that his disciples who acted with the power of Jesus and in Jesus' authority and in his name, he came to them. And we see the second failure, the failure and the tragedy of the disciples to be able to do this. They'd been given this power. They'd been sent out. They had done it previously. Yet somehow their faith was wavering. And they'd literally given up. They'd walked away. And here is this man. To all who are standing there, Jesus says, You unbelieving and perverse generation, how long shall I stay with you and put up with you? Their faith wasn't strong enough. They still were not placing their faith in Jesus and in His name, and in the power of the One who sent Him, which is God. What did Jesus do? He looked at this crowd, and not only were they not placing their faith in Him, think about this, many in the crowd were religious people. They were scribes, there were Pharisees, there were Sadducees that were there. What were they doing for this man whose child was suffering? Nothing. 
Nothing. Nobody had come up and put an arm around them. Nobody had had stepped up and offered sympathy. Nobody was doing anything to help. God help us when we stand back and we say, God bless you, or I'll pray for you, and we do nothing. Even while the boy was coming, coming, the demon threw him to the ground in a convulsion. Jesus rebuked the impure, impure spirit. First thing he did. The second thing, he healed the boy. And then the third thing, he gave him back to his father. Jesus took the steps that was necessary. Each case is individual. Jesus did what was necessary. And He healed the boy. But it didn't stop there. For you see, Jesus' healing is not just for the sake of a healing, but it's for the sake of restoration. Jesus takes this boy, this boy who, who loved his dad, but his dad was helpless and powerless. And He gives him back to his son restored. His health is restored, but the relationship is restored. He can now go with his dad and not worry about the consequences of the disease. That's what Jesus comes to do, is to restore relationships. When we come to Jesus and allow Him to restore our relationship to God the Father, we don't. We no longer have to worry about the consequences of sin. He takes care of that. He restores us fully. And here, I believe, is what Jesus was talking about when he was aggravated with the, the crowd. You unbelieving and perverse generation. The crowds were amazed. I'm sure that there were people that that maybe even said, wow, thank you, Jesus. Wow, this is incredible. This boy is healed. But not one person there recognized him as the Messiah, the one true way to God. There was another failure, and that failure was in understanding Everyone was marveling at Jesus. He said to his disciples, Listen carefully to what I am about to tell you. The Son of Man is going to be delivered into the hands of men. But they did not understand what it meant. It was hidden from them, so they did not grasp it. And they were afraid to ask him about it. Now remember, there's a, there's a huge difference in listening and and gaining an understanding of facts and a listening that leads to a deepening of faith, a deeper walk with Christ, a closer relationship with God, something that is active. It involves heart and mind. The disciples, they didn't get it. The Son of Man was going to be delivered into the hands of men. What does, that, what does that mean? But they were afraid to ask. Why did they not understand? I think so many times we, we come at things and we have these preconceived ideas. And when the Holy Spirit really speaks, we don't fully understand because our ideas are standing between us and God. Our ideas are blocking our, our ears and our preconceived ideas are shielding our heart from the true knowledge and the revelation that God's wanting to give us. Sometimes we do not have ears that hear and eyes that see. Our ideas, our, the things that we've been told, well, it's this way and it'll always be this way. No, I always go back to my mentor, Vernon Davis. And Vernon used to tell us as he taught the theology classes, he said, be sure 
when you write your theology. Do not write it in indelible ink, but write it in pencil and keep a great big eraser handy. It's not that God changes, but our understanding of God, the further we go, the longer we walk with Him, is going to grow and we're going to understand more of Him. And all of a sudden, these little things that, well, it's this way and it'll always be this way. No, that may be just a small part of all that God is and all that God is doing. You know, sometimes when we have our our theologies written down and, and we think we've got it. That's some of the times that we have problems with humility. In all of this, they, they didn't get it. They're, they're arguing about it. And, and an argument started among the disciples of the, which of them would be the greatest. You know, so many times we talk about having to 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 make the, to bridge the gap from what took place to what is applicable now. I always refer to it as our TLC. It's easy for me to remember our time, our language, and our culture. Time is different, language is different, culture is different. But you know what? Humanity stays the same. A lot of us, we really do. Um, I, I, I can really identify with these disciples in, in the, the, these, this movement of these four things. I'm thinking, yeah, there's times that my faith is not what it needs to be. There's times that I think, wow, I, I, I'm, I'm limiting what God can tell me because of my preconceived ideas. I have a problem fully understanding God. And then there's times that I have an issue with my humility. Listen to what he said. Jesus, knowing their thoughts, this is a, a very common statement of the day. It, it, it doesn't really mean he knows exactly the words, but the writer is saying he gets what they're thinking because they're arguing. He's listening to it. He took a little child. It may have been that little boy that he just healed, but he took a little child out of the crowd and he pulled him up close to him. And, and Jesus, I can just picture him holding him close to him, giving him affection, letting him know that he truly cared. And he used this as an illustration, a visual. Whoever welcomes this little child in my name welcomes me. And whoever welcomes me welcomes the one who sent me. For it is the one who is least among you who is the greatest. This idea of, of turning our conception upside down, turning our ideas upside down, and what is his intent? He wants us to think about it. What does he mean? The least is the greatest, and the greatest is the least. Sounds like his Sermon on the Mount in Matthew. What he, 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 He's talking about these disciples whom, with whom it's so easy to go from self-sacrifice. They're, they've left their families, they've left their, their jobs, they're following Him, they're serving Him, they're ministering to Him, and all of a sudden this self-sacrifice has turned to self-centeredness. Now, He wants them to see this, to really get it. And this child, now, Women and children were the lowest in the society. But children, the whole idea of, of the way things used to be where children were to be seen and not heard, that comes from ancient society. They were the, the littlest. But Jesus takes this little child, this most insignificant among the crowd, and pulls him up to the very center. He says, look at him. Look at him. Whoever welcomes him welcomes me. In other words, it's not about you. But it's about these in society that get overlooked. It's about these in society that get pushed away. It's about these in society that get pushed down. That's whom I love. 
That's who my love and that's who I identify with. Go to Matthew 25. He says, look at them. Don't look at yourself, but look at them. And then this last little strand that he wants us to hear deals with tolerance. Master, said John, we saw someone driving out demons in your name and we tried to stop him because he's not one of us. Do not stop him, Jesus said, for whoever is not against you is for you. Did you catch that in your name? He was casting out demons. Now, he, it's possible that he had been one of the crowd earlier, but he had left, he had gone his own way. And, and what was he doing? He was not do, uh, repeating a formula, but in the name of Jesus was his reality. It was his reality, it was his identity, and it was his power. Just like it is yours and mine. Salvation is never a formula. We, we can quote Romans 3.23, Romans 6.23, Romans 5.8, Romans 9, 9 uh, Romans 10.9 and 10, and Romans 10.13. We can turn that into a formula where it becomes nothing but head knowledge. But when it becomes reality, that's when it comes to the heart. And our response is from the heart, is when Jesus is reality. That's where it had become. You know, in our day and time, it becomes easy to become intolerant, to be intolerant of others. Well, he's not Baptist, or he's not Methodist, or he's not Church of Christ. Well, they don't go to Cowboy Church. It's all God's big, beautiful kingdom. And the diversity is where the beauty lies. And the ultimate beauty is the one who stands and reigns above it all, who is Jesus. Just because someone doesn't say it like I say it, doesn't make them wrong. If they possess the reality, which is Jesus, then they are part of us. During this time, we need each other. If you look back through church history, it's always when there were crises. It's always when there were tough times, even persecution, that the church rose up and stood reflecting and ministering in Jesus' name. It's when times were bad that the church has been at its best. This is our opportunity. This is our time for the church to shine, for our faith to shine, for our understanding to grow, for our humility to be put down, and for our tolerance of one another to increase. This is our time. How do we do it? Number one, we pray. Think, think about what Paul did in Ephesians with the armor of God. He says, finally, this time, be strong in the Lord and in His mighty power. Put on the full armor of God. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Therefore, because of this, put on the full armor of God, so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground. And after you've done everything to stand, stand firm then with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, with the breastplate of righteousness in place, with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to all this, take up your shield of faith, with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation, the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, and pray in the Spirit on all occasions. 
pray. Number one, pray. We have got a time where we can do what is best for our neighbor. Best for those that we don't even know but would come in contact with. During this time where uh, uh, of social distancing, of crowds no more than ten people, we have got more to do than we can get done. Start with praying. Next, go on to reading your word. We, he's, we always talk about, well, I just don't have time to get in my Bible. You have time now. It's your time. Stand in prayer. Stand in reading. And I would like to ask you, Cowboy Church, one person a day, make a phone call, send a text, do your Facebook thingamabob, whatever you do, Contact one person a day. Tell them you're praying for them. See if they have a need. We have the opportunity to rise up and show Jesus. Let's do it in His name. Would you pray with me? Father, I thank You. I thank You even for this time, as crazy and chaotic as it is. Here is a time, God, for us to shine. Here is the time, God, for us to do what we thought was not possible. Father, I speak a blessing over all of my family. I speak a blessing over this community, our leaders, our health care workers, our first responders. Bless them with strength as we do what's right in your name. God, we love you. With all that we have, we love you and we thank you for loving us. In Jesus' name, amen. Cowboy Church family, I will have another Bible study ready for you for Wednesday. I hope you're checking the uh, Pouring Out Cubes daily devotions. Got some fun ones coming up. I want you to know that I love you and I'm praying for you. In Jesus' name.